profoundly affects behavior in humans to see what kinds of gene expression changes occur and then go into people with certain types of mental illness, schizophrenia and psychosis and whatever, and, and, and go to the gene bank where some of these post-mortem brains are and say, okay, is LSE turning on some of the same genes that are turned on or turned off in some of these mental illnesses? So it was kind of a, another way to look at mental illness and say, well, we know that LSD produces these powerful behavioral changes. We know that there are certain kinds of pathologies where we have behavioral changes. Are there any, are there any leads we can find from what LSD does? Not that LSD produces those uh, mental illnesses, but rather there may be subsets of genes that, that affect behavior in both of the both LSD and, say, some of the behavioral states. Is there a drug stronger than LSD that you helped create? Well, the only one that I would know of is a compound we called EFLAD. Um, LSD interacts at a number of different biogenic amine receptors, dopamine, serotonin, a whole bunch of them. If you actually go to, uh, there's a website, the Psychoactive Drug Screening Project by Brian Roth at North Carolina, and you look at LSD, it hits a lot of different receptors. And I work in both serotonin, the psychedelics, and the dopamine field. And in the dopamine field, when you have a drug that stimulates dopamine receptors, at least of the D2 type of receptor, typically the most active compounds have an N propyl group, a three carbon chain attached to them. So I had the idea that let's take LSD, take off the, there's a methyl group attached to the nitrogen in LSD. Let's take it off and put some things on there that change that, but let's put on an ethyl and a propyl because the propyl group has the most effect at dopamine receptors. And so maybe if we're seeing both the dopamine and the serotonin effect, if we put that propyl group on, maybe what we can do is amplify the dopamine effect. So we made, oh, we took the methyl group off of LSD and probably made a dozen or so different derivatives of LSD where we had different types of alkyl groups attached to that nitrogen. We had a propyl and an allyl and cyclopropyl methyl and ethyl and a whole bunch of them and we tested them in rats. And the propyl allyl and the ethyl all were about equal potent in rats, and actually the ethyl was somewhat more potent. And this is back before the Controlled Substances Analog Bill was passed. We sent samples of them to Sasha and said, you know, here's some compounds we made, you want to keep them from reference samples. And he put, I believe he put those in either PCAL or TCAL. And the ethyl LSD, ethylad, is probably more potent than LSD, LSD by 20 or 30 percent. I mean, I think, I think maybe 70 micrograms or 75 micrograms is probably equal to about 100 micrograms of LSD. So from a clinical standpoint, that EFLAD is more potent um, than LSD. Um, the other ones that in rats were as, as potent as LSD turned out to be fairly benign. They had high potencies in humans but really didn't have a lot of the, uh, the psychopharmacology that you see in LSD. Um, there is a compound that's extremely potent, but as far as I know, is not active as a psychedelic, which is a series of N-benzyl compounds where you take two CI and you put substituted uh, the benzyls on the nitrogen. In animal studies, uh, those compounds are much more potent than LSD, uh, but as far as I know, they're not active in humans. And then, there, oh, there is another compound that's been making the rounds, this thing called bromo dragonfly, which I've seen a number of people talking about and forensic labs have been picking it up. That compound probably is, approaches the potency of LSD, although its toxicity to me, we don't know anything about toxicity, and I've heard that some people have died taking that compound at higher doses, so you know that I really don't know anything about it. And I hate to hear these things, but at least in rats, that compound uh, certainly approached or exceeded that of LSD. So there are some things that are well, the only one I know that's more potent in humans is the EFLAD, but these others in animal and preclinical studies look like they're very, very potent in terms of having LSD-like effects, but I know nothing really about the clinical effects. What is the importance of the cortex and serotonin 2A receptors? Well, in terms of the mechanism of action, uh, serotonin 2A receptors are the presumed target for all the psychedelics, and they occur in a number of places in the brain particularly in the cortex in layer five, the pyramidal cells are sort of the major computational units that are central to cortical processing function. And serotonin 2A receptors are located on apical dendrites of those pyramidal cells, and they regulate the sensitivity, if you will, of the cell 
to firing. They make them more sensitive. It tends to depolarize the cells. Um, so cortical function is critical to consciousness, to human, to humankind. I mean, the, the cortex, the human cortex, is really what makes us different from any other uh, animal, e even the like, non-human primates. And so uh, all the executive functions take place there. That's where you make really kind of makes sense out of the world. It's fundamentally involved, probably in consciousness. The best theories of consciousness involve uh, thalamocortical loops, where we have there's a an oscillatory frequency of around 40 hertz that involves the thalamus, the cortex, and uh, part of the striatum. So cortex is, is essential for consciousness. It's where everything comes together and as, as a picture. All of our sensor information except for smell gets sent to the cortex. So anything that perturbs processing in the cortex is going to perturb consciousness the way we see things. The two A receptors are also in some other key places, though. They're in the in the raphe nuclei in the brain stem, they're in the locus ceruleus and brain stem, the ventral tegmental area, also in the thalamus. And these are all areas that are involved in vigilance, level of vigilance, waking sleep states, especially some of the brain stem nuclei. And thalamus is, re regulates what actually gets sent to the cortex, so it's like a, a filter for sensor information. So this system is uh, pretty complex, and psychedelics and LSD hit it at almost every place that's important in processing sensor information and consciousness. Uh, in terms of, uh, I just saw a paper that just came out last year where they showed that serotonin 2A receptors were highly expressed in visual cortex. So you can see these papers where they talk about psychedelics producing these different patterns, wavy lines and circles and whatever, and a lot of people get all caught up in, in that. Well, now it makes sense because the first stop for sensory information from the eyes is the primary visual cortex, V1. And that's where serotonin 2A receptors are expressed. So now you throw a drug in there that affects those receptors, you're one of the very first things you do is probably to start affecting visual perception. But the cortex was your question, and that's really that's the central place where uh, everything really happens. In schizophrenia, for example, what you have is a loss of function in the cortex. The cortex basically uh, dies, it keeps progressively dies. Uh, so cortex is, is absolutely essential for consciousness and for perception and for sort of developing our concept of consensus reality, our concept of the world. All right, here's a loaded question for you. How does the psychedelic experience take place? Well, <laughs> yeah, this is, um, this is complicated. And I sort of just touched on a lot of the things that occur. But there's some other things. For example, um, in the parietal cortex, uh, they've studied people with lesions in the parietal cortex, and they've also done electrical stimulation. And the parietal cortex is related to self versus other non-self. So ego, non-ego, uh, ego versus uh, oneness. A lot of that occurs in the parietal cortex. Why does it happen there? I, I can't tell you. Um, in dreaming, uh, the only real difference between uh, dreaming and being conscious is the amount of sensory information that's getting into the cortex. When you're dreaming, the sensory inf information is basically cut off. But when you take a psychedelic, the sensory information, you're, you're still conscious, you're still aware, and sensory information starts getting shut down from the peripheral senses. But you're still able to get things out of hippocampus and limbic areas, emotions and memories and things like that. Um, you, and, and it's hard to explain what's happening, but these corticothalamic oscillations that occur, the 40 hertz uh, oscillations that are thought to be the origin of sort of consciousness, <clears throat> those uh, operate in a very uh, coordinated uh, fashion. Uh, cortical cells always operate at a, at a critical point where they're at the verge of chaos, and so information processing is highest there. Well, if you've already got something that's really working at a critical point, and now you throw a drug in that enhances the sensitivity and makes those cells even more sensitive. What I think happens is you lose that the regulation, and now you have really a kind of expanded consciousness in a really literal sense. You have cortical cells which um, their gain has been, been increased, um, so their processing uh, frequency has probably increased. They can operate at a higher frequency, like sort of overclocking a computer, but you shut out. Uh, by affecting the thalamus, you probably shut out a lot of the sensory information that's coming in. So you've got this processor that's eager and, and capable of processing lots of information, 
but the stuff it normally processes, the sensor information, has been shut down. And so, what's it processing? Uh, it's processing memories, emotions, feelings, etc. That's probably about as close as I can get to it, because beyond that, we just really don't know. Altering perceptions, if you want to talk about, you know, the walls getting wavy, the curtains breathing, and stuff like that, a lot of that is probably related to effects in the primary visual cortex, um, as well as maybe a few other places. Some of the processing in, in the cortex is affected. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff going on. It's all in like a dynamic balance, and you start throwing that out of kilter, so sensory processing starts getting distorted. But the transcendental mystical experience is the thing which is most interesting and which nobody can explain. There's something fundamentally that happens there that's different, and that's the big question. That's really what I'd like to figure out, but I don't think anybody can tell you what happens when that occurs. Stan Groff's work is the perfect example when he goes into uh, all of the telepathic experiences and the studies and things like that. It's uh, Where do you even begin to try and tackle something like that? Yeah, I mean, basically what you have to do is figure that you're shutting out the normal sensory stuff, the normal gating. I think there are probably a lot of people, and I've known them, that have sort of paranormal psychic instincts, and once in a while these things kind of you know, they'll leak through and they'll say, oh, yeah, I, I got a sense it's going to happen or whatever. But most people, you know, if you have those, I think you shut that out because they're not things that are necessary for your survival. And then you go into a state where you're shutting down all those normal, you know, governors and modulators that regulate sort of consensus reality, and, and the processor's running full bore and it's looking for such a process. And so when these things come through, you know, maybe it's a lot, a lot easier to see them. I guess one of the things, if you look back at the early work on creativity, is they said LSD helps people think outside the box. Well, maybe LSD just knocks the sides of the box down, you know. So. <laughs> I'm sure James Fadiman will appreciate that. Uh, One of the uh, more bizarre and sort of darker experiences that I've had with entheogens or psychedelics, 2CI. What is the importance of 2CI? Well... I've sort of developed the idea that every one of these molecules has its sort of own pharmacological personality. Um, you know, my son looked at the anti-inflammatory effects of DOI, but DOB doesn't, and LSD don't, ha I mean, they have it, but it's much reduced. And yet, you know, all we know is, well, they activate 2A receptors. The world of pharmacology is much more complex than that. And in fact, there's a concept now that's entering pharmacology that's very powerful. It's called functional selectivity. It turns out that brain receptors, say serotonin receptors, can couple to a whole host of different biochemical mechanisms, probably a dozen or more. And when serotonin interacts with the receptor naturally, it fits into the receptor, and the receptor is a, is a protein that has a, is dynamic and, and take on a particular shape. And the shape of the protein that's inside the cell allows it to couple to what are called effectors, the things that actually generate the biochemical signals in the cell. But now if you put a, a drug in other than serotonin, say it's 2CI or DOB or 2CB, when it binds to the receptor, the receptor, when it collapses around that molecule, it doesn't have the same shape as when serotonin is inside there. Um, you know, imagine having a, you've got large hands and you wear large gloves and you try to put your hands to an extra small size set of gloves or something. It doesn't fit or the gloves stretch out of shape or whatever. Well, the same thing apparently happens with different ligands when they, different molecules when they bind these receptors. The receptor can't collapse to that, what we'll call a natural state. It collapses to some unnatural state. And then the shape of the protein inside the cell is different and it doesn't couple to the same uh, effectors with the same efficiency that it had before. So there may be a different subset of signaling. So this is called functional 